High volume headshots on location. World. My name is Matt Spa, and I'm a photographer, videographer, and early riser in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm in the middle of day two of what for me is a high volume headshot job. This could be school portraits. This could be um, a number of performing artists at a theater company. This could be a bunch of corporate executives that you have to do all at the same time, thus high volume. For me, this job will end up being probably about 375 to 400 photos over the course of three days. I'll be able to do all of that essentially by myself and I'm going to show you how I do it. I've figured out some tricks that make it easier. i figured out some ways that kind of can help to guarantee success at the end of the job and we'll talk about all those today while we're here. The first thing you have to do to get this and get it done right and get called back again is take nice photos. I will talk about my settings, where my lights are, all the power settings, f-stop, shutter speed, all that stuff. We'll get into all those specifics to get good shots. But just as important, and maybe even more important, is to be extremely well organized. When I get a job like this, I will have the organization send me a spreadsheet that has a list of every single person that needs to be photographed. And in the case of this school, I've also got their ID numbers. Those ID numbers are going to have to match up to their name for their ID cards, for their photos to go into the yearbook, for the parents to be able to order prints, etc. So what I need to do is tie those two things together with a database and then tie them together when I shoot the actual images. And again, we'll talk more about that when we get into the specifics of the shoot. So organization is key. In my case, I will take that spreadsheet and I will actually print out each class. When those individuals come down, I ask that the teacher put them in alphabetical order. So my spreadsheet is listed. I'm basically going to receive kids in the order that they are on my spreadsheet and I'll have their number right there. The next thing that I have to have in this is some kind of helper. I have to have an assistant, and what I like to do is get the organization who is hiring me to provide that person. When they do, there's a very good likelihood that that person is going to know the facility well. They're also going to hopefully know the students or the actors or the individuals that you're taking photographs of, so they can really be helpful on a lot of different levels. The main thing that I need is somebody to feed me the numbers as the students come in, but also to be with me all the time. In my contract that I send out to a school to secure the work, it states that I will never be left alone with any of their students. So if I have an assistant with me, it's very helpful just to add an extra layer of protection. And when the school sees that in the contract that they get, it also lets them know that I'm aware that we need to have a certain amount of security. This is mission control basically for three days. I have got a laptop on a heavy duty laptop stand. This is a MacBook Pro. It is tethered to my Sony a7 III. And for my Capture, I'm using Capture One. Let's take a quick look at Capture One. There are some very powerful features here that make it ideal for tethered capture. First, it allows you to organize things really well. I can create separate sessions for each class and be able to easily access those and then go through the files that I need to. In addition to being really good at organizing stuff, it is a fantastic raw editor. It allows me to compensate for exposure. I can recapture highlights if I do manage to overexpose something somewhere, but it also lets me rename my files. So if I've shot, say, four images of a child, I've gone through and I've selected the one shot that I want to use, I can then take that shot click on the name and rename it to that child's ID number. Now this file is tied to my database because the last thing you want to do is lose track of which photo goes with which name. In the end, I can do almost everything that I need to do except for major retouching within Capture One. So ultimately, I'm going to need to create various different crops for different purposes. There's one crop for the ID card. There's a completely different crop for parents who want to order prints, things like that. I'm able to do all of that within Capture One, and I'm able to see exactly what I'm going to get, which is really, really helpful. So I'm tethered to Sony a7 III. The lens that I'm using is a Sony 70-200 f4. The f4 is fantastic because it mounts directly to my tripod. 
the camera is not mounted to my tripod. And what that allows me to do is rotate the camera 90 degrees so that I don't have to have an L bracket and all of my weight is still balanced over the center column of my tripod. Speaking of tripod, I'm using the Manfrotto 055 with the 502AH head. You can go watch my tripod trilogy if you want more information on why I love and hate this tripod. But for these purposes, it's perfect. Part of why I do these on a tripod, and I know a lot of people prefer to just go handheld because they have more flexibility. If I have a tripod and I keep my tripod exactly the same distance from the stool that I have people sitting on at all times, and all I do is move it up and down so I don't change the angle of it either, then all of my photographs will be proportionate when I'm done. In other words, when they drop all of these into a website or a yearbook or the program for next week's performance, everybody's heads are going to be proportionate as long as they don't change the proportion of the photos when they drop them in. Does that make sense? Put everything in at 100%, everybody's head is going to be relatively the same size that they are in real life. I hope that makes sense. The other thing that I do is I align my rule of thirds grid with the eyes. That gives me plenty of headroom on the top of the image for me to be able to make adjustments and crops as I need to, but it also keeps all of the images basically in the same position. So everybody's proportionate and everybody is essentially in the same position. Those two things alone will save you a ton of work on the back end in trying to correct crops and trying to get everything evened out. So I highly recommend the tripod. This tripod in particular has a column that goes up and down. So what it allows me to do is keep this at the same angle all the time, but move it up and down to ensure that the eyes are falling on that top rule of thirds grid line. Let's talk a little bit about settings. Like I said, this is an F4 lens, but I'm shooting at F5.6. And 5.6 allows that background to go nice and blurry, but it still keeps the eyes really sharp and even to the back of the ear will remain sharp. The shutter speed that I'm shooting is 1 200th of a second, which is the strobe speed of the strobes that I'm using. The strobe that I'm using for my key light is an Evolve 200, also known as an AD200 under the Godox name, mine are branded by Flashpoint because I buy them from Adorama. I find these to be extremely uh, reliable and consistent. I don't get varying powers once I get them set. And I think in 400 headshots, I had two misfires. And I think those were more a result of the transmitter than they were of the actual strobe themselves. So key light is the AD200, and I've got it set at one quarter output plus two thirds of a stop. So quarter output plus 0.7 stops. So it's not running full bore all day long. It's really running a little over quarter power, not quite half. So it allows me to have really fast recycle times as well. That key light is in a 43 inch glow softbox. The softbox has a single layer of diffusion and a grid in it. And that grid really helps me to control how much light is falling onto the background and keep it very localized onto the subject. I'm controlling the intensity of my flashes with an R2 Pro S controller. I think there's a newer one of these, but for me, these things have so many buttons and so many knobs that once I get used to finding what I need to find, I just stick with it. This is an extremely reliable unit. A pair of AA batteries will last me easily for this entire shoot. I can change the power of my strobes from here. I can also change whether they're operating in manual or TTL mode, and it's just really reliable. My hair light or rim light is just a speed light. It's in a Photix Easy Up box that's got a single layer of diffusion and again, a grid on it. The power on this unit is actually at 1 16th of full output. And what this does is it just gives me that little bit of rim light around the far side of my subject and helps to get a little bit of a highlight on that side of the face. For fill, I use a 42 inch reflector. This is a five in one unit that just pops out and I've got it on a simple stand that has a couple of clamps clipping everything together. 
I've got it low and at an angle, so it's helping to fill in those shadows underneath the chin, underneath the eyelids, and on the far side. As far as placement of everything goes, I know you can't see the whole setup here. I've got a time lapse, I'll throw that in, maybe it'll help a little bit, but I can give you an idea of the distances that I've got between things. So my stool is sitting at a 45 degree angle to the camera, and it's about four feet off of a hand-painted canvas backdrop that is six feet wide by nine feet high. You really don't need something that big for this, but I like to have it far away. I like to have some breathing room in here, particularly for younger students to come and go. It's not so claustrophobic or intimidating, hopefully. My key light is right here. It is about three and a half to four feet away from my forehead right here, the first thing that it's going to be hitting. And it's angled down at about 60 degrees or something like that. It's maybe 30 degrees off of a center line that would be right here. The light from that is being split. So half of it's kind of hitting me, half of it is hitting this reflector. The hair light or rim light that's back there is a little over four feet away. And I've got it to where my head is about in the center of that unit. So hopefully that gives you some idea of the layout that I've got here and just the way that I keep things set up for a number of reasons. One, obviously to make good looking photos, but to also allow people to come and go through this space pretty quickly. Before I wrap this up, I wanna talk a little bit about exposure. In this school, they have an extremely uh, diverse student body. So I have children that are very, very pale. We have students that wear uniforms. And so some of those are white, some of them are dark blue. We have skin tones that range through um, medium brown to very, very dark. I try to expose for that white shirt. Then I feel like I'm safe. When I get to individuals that have darker shirts or maybe darker skin, I can always tweak the exposure setting in Capture One, and it's another reason why I use it because it has so much flexibility in processing raw files. I'm able to do that and still get some consistency across the board, but get very nicely exposed images of everybody. I realize that's a ton of information in a relatively short period of time, but hopefully the setup that I use, the settings that I use, the way that I'm capturing things will be helpful to you if you're trying to do this kind of work. If you are trying to do this kind of work, having a reliable and repeatable workflow is gonna give you a foundation that you can go in with some confidence and things are gonna get screwy sometimes. Things are not going to go to plan, but if you have that reliable, repeatable workflow, you can confidently go forth with some flexibility when things do get off schedule or get behind, or maybe you just have a kid who doesn't wanna have their picture made and it takes you three minutes to get them done. It's all cool because you have a good system. I hope this content has been helpful to anybody who's out there thinking about doing this kind of work. If it was, please consider subscribing, give me a like and ring my bell and the thumbs up and all that other stuff. I'm gonna take about 150 more photos here and then I will hopefully get back to creating more content for my channel. So keep an eye out for that coming up in the future. And until then, thank you for watching.